Let's take a look now at presentation and the requirements are the same for all companies in that on the statement of financial position there will be a right of use asset, there will be a liability and in the income statement there will be depreciation and there will be interest charge as well. Now just considering this in a little more detail, whilst the standard does say that you do need to have a right of use asset and a liability, you don't necessarily have to show these as separate line items in the financial statements. For example, the right of use asset could just appear as part of property, plant and equipment and the lease liability could just appear as part of liabilities. If this is the case, if you don't actually split them out on the face of the balance sheet, then you must provide the split in the notes to the financial statements. So essentially, the standard allows you either disaggregation on the face of the accounts or disaggregation in the notes to the accounts. Now, from an exam point of view, you want to look and see how material these leases are to the organization as a whole and that will help you to decide on an appropriate method of presentation. But essentially, four components, an asset, a liability, depreciation and interest. Now, you may well be asked to discuss the impact of this, and there are quite a few impacts to think about. The first is that this new standard does actually mean we have a front-loaded expense recognition pattern. Now, under the old treatment for operating leases, all expense was just recognised on a straight-line basis. However, under this new standard, we see that at the start of the lease, the asset will be big and the liability will be big. And therefore, at the very least, what we will see is that the interest charge will be larger at the start of the lease agreement and the interest charge will be smaller at the end of the lease agreement. And in that sense, we are achieving a front loading of expense more expense at the start of the lease agreement and less expense towards the end. The same could also apply on the depreciation charge, but that would apply on whether or not you used a straight line method of depreciation or a reducing balance method of depreciation. But certainly in respect of interest charge, more expense in earlier years, less expense in later years, and that's very different from the old treatment of operating leases where the same amount of expense was being recognised each year. There's a further impact on gearing because of course we've put the liability now on the balance sheet and in the exam you may well have to go ahead and recalculate to a gearing ratio based upon the liability that has now been recognised. Look out for a company that has existing debt and existing banking covenants because, of course, the recognition of the liability under the lease agreement could result in a breach of that banking covenant if that banking covenant was based upon gearing. And, of course, another common measure which is often used for banking covenants is interest cover. How many times does your operating profit cover your finance charges? And, with this IFRS 16 presentation, we can see that one of the components in the income statement is the interest charge on the lease. So gearing and interest cover ratios will be worse, expense patterns will change, and we may have to manage stakeholder expectations with regards to these impacts associated with the presentation of IFRS 16. Let's think now for a moment about lessor accounting, and the good news is there are no major changes from the old standard IAS 17. So IFRS 16 requires us to identify whether we are dealing with a finance lease or an operating lease. So from the lessor's perspective, are we leasing equipment out under a finance lease or an operating lease? If we're leasing the equipment out under a finance lease, then what we have to calculate is the net investment in the lease. And this is calculated as the present value of the lease payments that are receivable by the lessor together with the present value of any unguaranteed residual value accruing to the lessor. And based upon this net investment in the lease, we will calculate finance income using the interest rate uh, implicit in the agreement. Now in a moment I'll show you that with numbers and explain those phrases a little further. If however we are leasing the equipment out under an operating lease, then we still have the equipment in our accounts and we just continue to recognise rental income on a straight line basis.
And with the operating lease, you might argue, well, how can we have the equipment in our accounts if the lessee has the equipment in their accounts? Well, do remember that the lessee has not capitalized the physical equipment, they have capitalized the right to use the equipment. And there's a difference between the lessor and lessee accounting. So let's go on and have a look at some numbers. So from the lessor's point of view, the first activity is to calculate an asset for the balance sheet. And as we know, assets are access to economic benefit. So what is our access to economic benefit? Well, we have the right to recover money from the lessee in the form of lease payments. And so what we will calculate is the present value of those minimum lease payments receivable by the lessor, and that will give us the first part of our debtor. Now, under lessor accounting, this is referred to as net investment in the lease. So the net investment in the lease is made up of the present value of the minimum lease payments receivable by the lessor. But it also includes the present value of unguaranteed residual value. Now, at the end of the lease term, the lessee has guaranteed that they will actually give us four in respect of the asset, as it has some residual value remaining. However, our expectation is that we would be able to sell the asset for an amount of five. And therefore, we have an unguaranteed residual value of one. And this, from our point of view, is a further amount of investment. And therefore, the net investment in the lease comes to a total of 31, comprising the present value of the minimum lease payments receivable by the lessor and the present value of any unguaranteed residual value. So that's taken care of the balance sheet side of things. In respect to the income statement, what we want to do is we want to earn some finance income. And this is simply a case of applying amortized cost to our net investment in lease. So the opening net investment in the lease is 31. If we assume an effective interest rate at 5%, this would give us finance income of 1.55. And of course, as we earn that finance income, the corresponding side of the entry goes to the net investment on finance lease on the balance sheet of 1.55. So credit finance income, debit net investment in finance lease. Let's just spend a couple of minutes now thinking about lease modifications. And what we have to decide when we modify the lease is whether it is a modification to the existing lease or it constitutes a brand new separate lease. So, for example, if you went from a situation where you leased one vehicle to a situation where you leased two vehicles and the amount of the lease payments increased by an amount that was a fair market price for leasing an incremental vehicle, then we would, in fact, have a separate lease. We would now be leasing two separate vehicles. If, however, you simply remained with the one vehicle but increased the amount of time that you were leasing that vehicle for, then this would not constitute a separate lease. And all that's happened in this situation is that you've actually increased the scope of the original lease agreement. And where that's the case, we quite simply remeasure the liability because of the additional commitments that we now have and adjust the right of use asset accordingly. So the increment to the liability is exactly matched by the increment to the right of use asset. Now, alternatively, it could be a situation where we are actually decreasing the scope of the arrangement. So, for example, imagine you rented a retail outlet with 1,000 square feet. And a few years down the line, there was an economic downturn, and now you need to cut in half the amount of square footage that you're actually renting. So you go to the landlord asking for a reduction from 1,000 square feet to 500 square feet. Now, what we would need to do in this situation is to reduce the right of use asset by 50%. However, when you come to reduce the liability, it's very unlikely that you will be able to achieve a 50% reduction in the liability. I don't think the landlord would be that forgiving. And therefore, if there is a difference between the 50% reduction in the right of use asset and the reduction in the liability, then the balancing figure goes as a gain or a loss to the profit and loss account. Our final area of consideration is sale and leaseback arrangements. Now, in order to account for these properly, what we have to do is to decide when we sell the asset and lease it back, 
we have to decide whether in substance the sale has occurred or in substance the sale has not occurred. And we use the criteria in IFRS 15 revenue recognition to help us make that decision. Here we're focused on the accounting treatment. If the substance is that a sale has occurred, then we must de-recognise the carrying amount of the asset. And now that we're leasing it back, we must recognise a right of use asset. And we will recognise a gain or a loss. So de-recognise the carrying amount of the asset, recognise the right of use asset, and recognise a gain or a loss. And in a moment I'll show you those three aspects with numbers. If, however, the substance is that a sale has not occurred, then in relation to the proceeds that we've actually received, we must debit cash, and the credit is to set up a financial liability in accordance with IFRS 9. So in this example, let's assume using the IFRS 15 criteria that, in substance, a sale has occurred. Now we're likely to find the following information in a question. Perhaps we've sold premises to a third party for 86. We're going to lease it back over a 10 year period. Perhaps the, the asset, the premises, has a market value of 90. It could be that in the financial statements, the net book value of those premises is currently 50, and the present value of the minimum lease payments is 30. Now, the first thing we have to do is to calculate the right of use asset. Now we did have an asset in our accounts at 50, and although we have sold the asset, in some respect, some of the original asset of 50 remains, because we are getting access to it. And so what we'll do is take the carrying amount of 50, and we'll multiply it by a fraction. And that fraction compares the present value of the minimum lease payments 30, against the fair value of the asset 90. So taking the netbook value of 50, multiplying it by 3 ninths, that gives us 16.67. So we no longer have an asset in our accounts, but we do have the right to use asset in our accounts, and we're measuring this at 16.67. Now you'll also notice that we sold the premises to a third party for 86, but that the premises had a market value of 90, and that's a difference of 4. The third party has given us four less than the asset is actually worth. And this is to be treated as a prepayment to the lease. And as we saw earlier on, these prepayments constitute part of the right of use asset. So our right of use asset is made up of the 16.67 and the four to give us a right of use asset of 20.67. And now we have that right of use asset, the journal becomes straightforward to put together. We account for the cash proceeds of 86 with a debit. We remove the original asset of 50 from the financial statements. However, as we are leasing the asset back, we must establish a right of use asset with a debit at 20.67. We also need to recognise a lease liability for the present value of the minimum lease payments, and that's the figure of 30. And to make the journal balance, we need a further 26.67 on the credit side, and this is to be treated as a gain on disposal. It's a journal that's worth practicing a few times, and making sure that where you get a situation in a sale and leaseback agreement, where in substance a sale has occurred, you can put that set of numbers together.